Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Mind Matters. I'm Harrison. Joining me today, we have Carolyn joining us for the first time in a while. Say hi, Carolyn. Hi. <laughs> so uh, um, for those of you that listened to our old show, The Truth Perspective, you might recognize Carolyn. For those who are new to Mind Matters, um, she used to be a regular on the show, and then we kind of uh, schedules day diverted, and then uh, we kind of got on our thing with um, Alan and Corey, who could not make it today. So um, we're going to be discussing a cool topic, uh, mass beliefs, and uh, why everybody knows that. So um, kind of, we've been reading, you know, stuff as usual, and um, just the topic came up on, well, actually from last week's show when we were describing um, epistemology and kind of like how we know things, and and um, a part of that is why we believe things and where our beliefs come from. Mm -hmm. So we're going to kind of take a look at the, perhaps the kind of deeper implications of that, because oftentimes, I mean, we've discussed, we've discussed stuff like this on the show and why people believe the things they do and especially why groups of people believe certain things. And um, usually just by looking at the the standard explanations, like, um, you know, crowd psychology, which we'll get into a little bit and just, um, the, you know, e maybe even the, the evolutionary basis of beliefs, um, at the, you know, Evo psych, evolutionary psycho psychology, um, the kind of Jonathan Haidt type of stuff with, um, you know, moral tribal clans of, um, you know, belief structures and, but, uh, all of those don't seem to really go far enough, I think. So we're going to look at that, including, um, you know, some of the books and topics we've discussed before like the crowd um what was who's the author of the the crowd again carolyn do you remember i um, think it's le bon yeah here. gustav gustav le bon yeah so yeah. We'll, a little bit of that a little bit of first sight and some uh, philosophy and stuff like that so maybe just to start out with um like the the whole mass belief thing so well it's a it's a common it's a common thing in any in any given culture in any any different um, like time period, to have like a set of beliefs that kind of everyone kind of believes, yeah, they're just kind of accepted, right? And they go unquestioned. Yeah. And the 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 thing that we're wondering about is how those propagate, um, and that's what that's what kicked it off for me uh, when uh, Corey was kind of on that part of it. It uh, reminded me of actually a uh, children's. It's a kind of fantasy book that I read a couple of years ago. And there was a part of it. I don't know if anybody's a fan of, you know, young adult fantasy, but I am. And uh, a woman named Catherine Valente wrote a series called The Fairyland Book. And she postulated in one of her books the principle of everybody knows that. And she describes it as... When an EKT field, she's kind of a steampunk chick, so EKT field is in effect, everyone within its power will know a good deal about the object, in this case it's a quest, even if they can't say where they heard about it or why it's so deathly important. They'll chat about it with any passing stranger like it's sizzling local gossip. Uh, everybody knows that. If you, trust, if you want to know the score, just find out what everybody knows. So I, I thought that was a really interesting idea that, that she was articulating because it was slightly, you know, it was out of the real world and yet such a thing could apply. And in her version, it was kind of a magical thing. But we see it all around us. Mm -hmm. So, Well, one of the things that came to mind when we were talking about this, you know, before the show was, well, just some of the things that everybody knows or things that they know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are hundreds of examples, but the ones that immediately came to mind were... Um, like you, you see this a lot nowadays in in the news, the the kind of anti-socialist like mentality, mm -hmm. like the the kind of um, uh, not just the mentality, but the well, you see that a lot in the states and even in the UK, um, the kind of like primal fear of anything that hints at socialism. Mm -hmm. But when you ask people what socialism really is or what the, what they think it really is, they have no idea. Right. And they might they might list some like policies that they think of as socialist policies which might be considered socialist policies in some spheres, but um, 
but they don't really know what they're talking about. And it's the exact same thing from the anti-capitalist perspective. Right. So you get the, the people that are, are just um, totally rail against capitalism, and you ask them, well, what exactly is capitalism? And they don't know either, or they've got some idea. And what it basically, like uh, what it seems to come down to is, um, now this is going to be a gross oversimplification too, but just, well, so I'll say some of the people that are like rabidly anti-socialist, they have this per this uh, perception of anything socialist as being like this totalitarian authoritarian structure mm -hmm. of like oppression and control and and gulags mm -hmm. and that's socialism right and or or socialism might be um just um like giving lazy people free stuff mm -hmm. and but and, you, and they'll be able to cite and you know one particular example within their experience that confirms this sweeping belief mm -hmm. that they have mm -hmm. but with no real kind of understanding of mm -hmm. like you know the history or the ideologies because they're a lot more complex than mm -hmm. than you can just like rattle off in a in a few yeah. like talking points and then and so with the anti-capitalists it's like well what's bad about capitalism you pretty much get a, a description of just greedy people right um and as, it, as they stand there with their iphones right <laughs> <laughs> so so there are these but but the beliefs are there so it's like mm -hmm. people have this this um aversion to you know either of these systems which may even you know they might be they might be railing against socialism without realizing that um that their their own country has a lot of socialist aspects according to what they might even define as socialism mm -hmm. and same thing with capitalism you might have a lot of um capitalist I um ideas or ideas that are associated with capitalism that that you like practice in your everyday life and don't have a problem with but you've just never made the connection that maybe those things are historically and contemporaneously associated with capitalism but these but these ideas permeate Mm -hmm. And so it's not just um, it's not just like economic and political things, but you have like entire worldviews that can permeate like a culture and do. Mm -hmm. That's like any kind of tribal belief system. So you have one group with with their god or gods, and then another group with their god or gods, and everybody in those cultures knows the truth about you know their cosmology, their worldview. Mm -hmm. And um, but it, it goes to um, well, it applies to any anything that you can have a belief about. So you can have. Um, beliefs uh, in the in like the realm of health and um, and medicine, you know, like the guys talk about in the health and wellness show all the time. All of the the myths and the changing trends too. So everybody knows. Well, up until recently, everybody knew that you know cholesterol was bad for you, right. that eating you know egg yolks and fat was bad for you. Our vaccines were good for you. Right. Yeah. Well, and um, well, yeah, and ev it's just something that everybody knows. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you know uh, around comes. A few new studies that that say, oh, that's not really, that's not actually true, and actually it was never true, and then the 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 kind of the trend changes, the mass belief changes. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there are well, so how does that really happen? So, we've got the kind of mundane explanations where, like mm -hmm. people people do tend to um, to look to authority for like the answers about things that they don't have any time or inclination to to research, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, yeah. the doctors have studied, have gone to school, they've been instructed in the, the arts of of you know medicine, so they should know what they're talking about, so I'm going to trust them. Right. And who are you to question them? You didn't go to school for ten years and, you know, get your MD. Mm -hmm. So so why are you just gonna trust something you read on the internet when when my doctor tells you know, my doctor is a is a good guy. Mm -hmm. I trust him, and he's you know he's a real doctor. So listen to him. Mm -hmm. So there's that, and that that will permeate the the culture and and the just the the kind of field of belief within a culture. Mm -hmm. And then, um, or, did well, you say I was something? Gonna say, well, the 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 thing that gives those things strength too is is the propagation of sort of the appropriate symbols. Not only mm -hmm. does he have the MD after his name, there's the white coat, there's the whole. Uh, there's a whole gestalt of image yeah. mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. attaches. So, and you can you can flood the culture with that image, and reinforce it. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's that is one of the mundane explanations, but it's a very powerful one. Yeah, and um, so that here you'll have all of the all of the influences that you'll get from um, you know watching any kind of YouTube channel on like persuasion or mm -hmm. um, um, or all the medical shows that mm -hmm. ran through the '70s and '80s. I mean, probably. I'm dating myself here, but probably 40% of media programming for entertainment were mm. hospital-related shows. Yeah, hospital dramas. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, for sure, and they're still on. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, but yeah. Then on top of that, though, um, you've got the 
the like the this is the stuff that we talked about on a previous show. The I think the guy's name was Daniel Kravitz. The social contagion books. So the social contagions that spread. And this would be more on a well. This is with a focus on the more emotional angle of belief formation. Mm -hmm. So, um, and not necessarily even just belief formation. It's it's well, it it's everything really. There there's this contagion effect that applies to like even physical symptoms, um, emotions, mm -hmm. and beliefs. Mm -hmm. So the social contagion can be like a combination of all three of those. So you have like the 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 suicide um, phenomenon where one person commits suicide and then that will trigger like a, an entire kind of um, like wave or a cluster, a cluster of, of suicides around that right. first individual. Mm -hmm. And so you can get, it's worse if it's like a famous person, if a, I can't remember the example, but there was a, a famous suicide Kurt um, Cobain. Well, well, that might, yeah, that's one. It wasn't the one in the, in the book, though, but there was a famous suicide. And then, like, suicides, the cluster lasted for, like, I don't know, it seemed like, if I remember correctly, months or even years mm -hmm. afterwards mm -hmm. of people, like, um, like um, what would be the word? Recreating, um, imitating well, this, right. this suicide. They, well, it's a for, it's, it would be, like, the ultimate form of identification. Mm-hmm. And so, but you get this on a small scale too. Like it's at the the example in the book was this uh, school in Palo Alto, and um, um, kids like killing themselves by jumping in front of the trains. And uh, like there were cl there was a cluster like every year or every couple of years. And then mm -hmm. um, so there were there are a lot of researchers trying to find out why because it's a strange phenomenon where this mm -hmm. thing happens. But it's not so strange when you realize that it's very common. Um, not just in suicide, but all over the place. It's like a common general phenomenon mm -hmm. that applies to all kinds of particular, um, um, like individual phenomena. No, an anorexia is another. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Anorexia. There was multiple personality disorder. You know, satanic ritual abuse. Yeah. Um, today, there's the like the the what's it called like rapid onset like gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria. Well, it's it seems like that. The one common theme underlying them all is kind of this this free floating anxiety that is that is grasping for some kind of label to put on it. Mm -hmm. And so when you have this general sense of unease and somebody hands you, you're uneasy, you're frightened because you are suffering X. And if that's a a, a thing within your social milieu that will spread very quickly mm -hmm. because okay i've got the answer it's x and you go tell your friend and the reason we both feel this way is because x and that will that will spread as a social contagion yeah that's a that's an interesting point it's like um it's not just that it's not just that you you're feeling something specific and then the you get the name for it and like you know you've got like a a very specific um um, you know, a set of symptoms or something, and then you find out, oh, that's X, you know, that's that's Asperger's or something. Right. No, it's like, it is like a very vague thing that only takes shape once the shape is provided mm -hmm. through the, through what you, uh, through the influences in your social environment. So it's like this, like you said, it's like this vague, free-floating, like, anxiety that isn't really anything specific, but then once it has the the kind of, the form to attach to, mm -hmm. it ends up taking on that form. Right. So it's like the... Um, and you see that in a lot of a lot of cases now. You know, not all cases of gender dysphoria, but a lot of cases with especially young girls, like teenage girls, mm -hmm. where it's a it's a rapid onset and it happens in, in a cluster. Mm -hmm. It's often a group of friends. And when you consider how rare like gender dysphoria actually is, that shouldn't happen. Right. Like it shouldn't happen that you get a a group of four to five close friends and they all get to, you know s suddenly get um, or start exhibiting symptoms of you know gender dysphoria. Right. It doesn't make any sense. And then, um, and then, like a lot of those cases, they do grow out of it. So, so it, it was like a type of like temporary, um, weird, you know, change in their in their psychology. Whereas for you know other cases, um, like the, the the gender dysphoria that has been on the you know on the books for years, it's like something that that um, an individual might have for a long period of time from a very young age. Yeah, two and three, interesting. Yeah. But uh, another another interesting uh, part of that cluster phenomenon is the girls at least the the initial case seems to be an autistic girl hmm. so there's a, a general social anxiety right off the bat and uh she may initiate it or she may become part of it because that is a way of fitting into a group mm -hmm. and it also plays into whatever quirks their autism takes on mm -hmm. so and that's the that's the important part too is the is the 
the group aspect, the commun the communal aspect to it, because that's uh, they found their tribe. Right, right, and like so traditionally, you'd have a, a bigger tribe, and you'd all share the same beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, so, like this is so this is what John the stuff that Jonathan Haidt might talk about, yeah. um, like the moral tribes that form around um, you know certain mindsets, certain worldviews, yeah. and so for examples of that, you just have to look at well political parties. And that kind of ties into the anti-capitalist, you know, anti-socialist view. Like you'll get a lot of, like on the on the radical left, you'll get the the hardcore anti-capitalists that you know don't really, might not, probably not even know what they're talking about when they when they're railing against capitalism. And then you'll get the the arch conservatives who are anti-socialist who who you know anytime they see a, a socialist they just picture Stalin, mm -hmm. um, and might and you know may not even be aware of of you know just the the vast like all the ideas and that, that attached to him yeah. you know like they have this image of stalin there's a huge number of ideas attached to that image that they're not even really aware of but but what what interested me was more what sets the ground beneath mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. that's what um that's what i was interested in talking about is is how does it's it's like tilling a field. What tills the field that gives the ground for these associations to even arise? Mm -hmm. So, all that right, would be interesting. Um, and you know, a, a really famous example is uh, the invention of the telephone. Mm -hmm. The telephone. Everybody says, "Oh, Graham Bell invented the telephone," but he actually was competing with four or five other people. None of them appeared to be in contact with each other, and apparently he beat a gentleman named Alicia Gray to the patent office by two hours, hmm. and he got the patent. And the uh, an actual person, I was looking this up, with Wikipedia has its uses, uh, there was a guy named, an Italian guy named Meucci, uh, M-E-U-C-C-I, who had actually invented it, five years before. Mm -hmm. So this whole idea, this idea of communication over wires was around, even though these people did not seem to be, I mean, inventors in the 19th century were notoriously secretive. Mm -hmm. You did not tell anybody what you were doing, this idea of free sharing of information, especially when there was money to be made. Mm -hmm. You just didn't do it. But in this time period, this 10 to 20 year time period, that idea was around and why mm -hmm. you know that's why, why. <laughs> <laughs> well that kind of that can get into um the stuff i mentioned you know in, in the intro about the kind of more far out theories that we've been talking about like first sight mm -hmm. and uh you know in process philosophy um because the like carpenter's idea is that we're we're constantly surrounded not by material objects or even by um um, you know, just ideas, like the, the, the ideas that we receive through our senses, you know, through the, the books that we read, through our eyes, or through the, the things that we hear people say in person, on TV, on the radio, on the internet, mm -hmm. uh, you know, through our ears, that there is, on a more fundamental level, there is a, a mode of perception, mm -hmm. um, which he calls prehension, which, you know, Whitehead also called prehension, right. that, um, that is pre-sensory, or non-sensory in nature, mm -hmm. and the way Carpenter described it is that we're we're constantly um, that we we live in and are constantly like in relation living in relation to and like in communion with what he calls like a world of meaning, and that the 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 meaning is this kind of like well meaning is is the, the like the fundamental word that he uses maybe as some like synonyms we can use like a world of like information but. But meaningful information. Mm -hmm. It's like things that are things that are po are potentially more or less meaningful than you know in relation to you or from the perspective the the individual perspective of you than anything else. So mm -hmm. so there's there's a, a world of and a range of potential meanings. So like um, and it can be different for for each individual. It can be similar for groups of pe for groups of individuals. It can be similar for in entire species or you know mm -hmm. forms of forms of beings, whatever those forms are. And, um, but, but you're confronted with potential meanings in the sense of, oh, in this moment, like given my history and given my, cur my current circumstances, this is the most important. Yeah. 
and this other stuff is not important. In another situation, that other stuff might be important, and the thing that was important in that first instance becomes unimportant. And there's so there's this constant, um, constant like um, like weighing and measuring going on on this unconscious level mm -hmm. that's determining the like the, the the hierarchy of values of the things that will then enter your conscious perception, and the range of things that are influencing influencing you in that way are infinite. Right. So everything from like the everything from like every every configuration of matter within a like a um, within a range of of meaningful influence on you so you know so like the, the, the things in the room the things in your community in your city mm -hmm. on the entire planet in the entire solar system mm -hmm. um, potentially um, beyond that but the you know so the further you get probably the less meaningful and important that stuff becomes so it kind of just so there's probably like a, a distance limit where right. you know most things just get automatically written off as um, you know, unimportant. Don't need to be influenced by that to any mm -hmm. to any great degree. The the things that are more most important tend to be the things that are closer to you, um, like spatially, right. but not always. It I, it would be what affects you personally, right? You know that that would that would be the most salient thing. Is that will this change my circumstance in some kind of way, for better or for worse? So mm -hmm. that would be what you pay attention to. So, but um, the. The thing is, too, so, okay, you've got a certain society. Let's take America in the 50s. Capitalism is good. America is the best. Blah, 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 blah. But in that time period, in the early, late, early to mid-50s, there began percolating the opposite idea, which, you know, where did that come from? What, you know, was it somebody's just psychological reaction to... The repressive 50s or whatever but you know and it didn't take full form till almost 20 years later and yet that idea started to percolate mm -hmm. and you know where did that come from and you know you can, you can look back and point to the beat poets you can look back and point to kinsey Ugh. you can you know and so you know and then you know from there you can get into ponderology mm -hmm. these these very you know warped individuals who managed to fish out somebody whose prehensile field was susceptible to mm -hmm. those ideas? Yeah, so so you, so you can trace it back. Um, like, so you, let's say you've got a new like social movement or some of some sort, you know, a new ideology. You can trace that back to usually you know the person that wrote the book. Mm -hmm. You know, you can trace um, you know certain a certain form of communism back to Marx and Engels. Mm -hmm. And um, you can, well, any kind of movement you can trace back usually to like an originary, you know, founder of some sort. But like you said, like the question then remains, well, where did they get the, that idea? And that's actually a deep question about um, not just these specifics, but about the nature of um, inspiration in general, the, nat the, the nature of creativity. Mm -hmm. Like where do new ideas actually come from? Where does creativity come from? You know, where does a new symphony come from or, you know, a new mm -hmm. song or... Um, um, you know, a new a, a new mathematical like breakthrough or theorem, um, and your your psychological makeup would skew the kind of information you you pay attention to. So you get a schizoidal type like Marx. Mm -hmm. There's all of this information, some of it very good, some of it very uplifting, and yet, what ideas did he pitch on? This very narrow, rigid economic view of society. So. Mm -hmm. That's it. It seems to be that that that's one of I think uh, I wasn't sure whether it was Carpenter who called it filters. So, it's it's also intertwined, you know, because all information is available, but you only choose certain information. You choose certain information because of your psychological emotional makeup, mm -hmm. but that goes back and it goes back and go back and go back and go mm -hmm. back, you know. But at some point, it becomes influential. Mm -hmm. That's. That's the question. Uh huh. <laughs> well, that uh, when I was thinking about this topic, it reminded me of a of a, just a passage I read in this book by David Ray Griffin that just came out a couple of years ago, I think. Yeah, 2017, uh, called "Process Theology" um, on postmodernism, morality, pluralism, eschatology, and demonic evil. So, <laughs> um, so That's he's got the he's light, got, light reading yeah. there. So he's got this section on what he calls demonic evil, which he doesn't consider to be like, um, you know, the, the kind of 
cartoon version of the you know the devil on your shoulder or something or mm, no pitchforks uh, right no pitchforks which you know I think might be um, I, I kind of like the pitchforks but uh, but but he says something interesting in it I, I just want to read a few paragraphs in here um, so uh, let's see here so he's talking about this idea of um, of demonic evil as not being necessarily an individual being, but something that arises out of the, essentially out of the free will of humans that that choose on some level to do evil. Mm -hmm. And that, that that can create, um, well, he says it consists instead of what can be called a quasi-soul. Um, now, you know, I wouldn't necessarily reject the idea of of like a more more traditionally like demonic force as being like an like an actual um, like or actual beings mm -hmm. of some sort that you mean uh, with with agency and intelligence yeah, and all that yeah okay. um, but um, but I can see where he's coming from like th this goes back to what like what we said on the show you know a few weeks ago about how um, like a lot of these philosophies they they like they cut off the the ladder of being you know at humans at the top and then you know there's God above that. But there's this entire potential like space between the level of the ultimate and and humanity that's left unexplored. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it wasn't left unexplored in traditional societies or even you know even mm -hmm. um, you know Christian theologies up and right. you know up until a couple hundred years ago. Well, even today, you know, there are still Christian groups that believe in 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 angels and demons and yeah. stuff like that. Well, there was angelology and demonology, and that mm -hmm. was like the, the there's reams that was written speculating even even naming particular entities mm. and qualities so you know you yeah that didn't stay an in industry for a couple hundred years without something behind it i would think <laughs> right and so i don't like so i'd at least leave open the possibility that there's like a grain of truth behind that and they might they may not have been correct about the details mm. um but there there may be something to that idea of um of like let's just say beings between us and the ultimate but uh, you know, leaving that aside for the minute, I, get, getting back to this idea that uh, the Griffin's trying to get a, across, um, um, he he calls. So I said he basically calls it a quasi soul. Um, he calls it the supra personal power of evil, and he's talking about this guy um, Walter Rauschenbusch, um, who gave this account in his theology for the social gospel, and he says that Rauschenbusch described the structures and habits that promote sin, describing how people are seduced into sin through the power of authority and imitation long before they have reached the age of accountability. So this is a, just kind of like the social forces theory mm -hmm. so far. Mm -hmm. um, to all that, Rauschenbach says, we, we can add a form of influence that works at a pre-sensory level and at a distance. So this is what he's getting at. He's kind of like, um, this is the, the problem that we were having. It's like, okay, so you can, you, you can take all that, all those social forces and, and interpersonal forces so far, but is there something deeper? Mm -hmm. Um, there's seems to, it seems that it would have to go deeper, especially if, um, if you can't achieve a, a full description of reality just on the level of, you know, the interpersonal and the psychological, like there's a deeper level of reality beyond that. Well, I think in some, some writers around the turn of the 19th century would call it the spirit of the age. Or mm -hmm. the spirit of the people, mm -hmm. and that got corrupted into a whole race thing. Like, like this is one of my my knocks on the the bonds. The crowd is he was attributing like a good nineteenth century guy to different souls of peoples of races. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, he's terribly, terribly politically incorrect. But if you read it properly, you can see what he's getting at. Mm -hmm. So that would that would be the tribalism that that there is an possibly an overarching spirit governing governing mm -hmm. the tribe mm -hmm. you know yeah um and uh so griffin kind of gets into this like he so he goes over um just briefly because it's an introduction like for people that aren't familiar with it he goes briefly into like the parapsychological research so this is the kind of stuff that uh you know that carpenter is talking about in first sight mm -hmm. and then you know some background on whitehead's philosophy and worldview and his view of of perception um um, and, and pre-sensory, like, prehension. So then Griffin writes this. Um, so he's talking about psychokinesis. So he says that cases of reported psychokinesis can be regarded as merely conspicuous instances of a kind of pervasive psychic influence that is radiating from our, from our minds all the time. From this perspective, we can suppose that we are influencing each other directly, soul to soul, all the time. And we can suppose that through the enormously complex web of psychic influence that results, 
we are born into a kind of quasi soul. So this would be like um, probably exactly what you're talking about, mm -hmm. um, which shapes our souls for good or ill and to which we in turn contribute, thereby adding our influence for good or for ill to the psychic ether that will shape our souls. Um, so then he goes on. So for example, if a certain image has been focused upon by devotees of a particular religion for hundreds, perhaps thousands of years, this image will be impressed upon the unconscious portion of the psyches of present day individuals with considerable power. This incidentally is a way of explaining the reality and power of Jungian archetypes, a way that Jung himself described, or some, a way that Jung himself sometimes employed. Rupert Sheldrake's New Science of Life is also based on the cumulative effects of repetition. Um, that would be like the morphogenetic fields. Mm -hmm. Or the habits. Yep. As you defined it. So, um, last quote here, he says, what Rauschenbusch called a kingdom of evil into which we are born can be imagined as a demonic quasi-soul that not only influences us indirectly through our sensory experience, but also directly through spiritual influence. Mm -hmm. So... This would be again just a. This is a subset of the more the more general kind of like a, the more general like philosophical rule, I guess, um, a just ontological rule about reality and about the nature of of humans and beings themselves, specifically in the the realm of like um, of these beliefs and these these negative beliefs. Yeah. But uh, but we can apply that outwards. So so what he's basically describing is, <clears throat> or to 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 kind of tie it into what we've been talking about. Like let's say you get. Let's bracket aside for for uh, for the moment, like where the original idea comes from. Mm -hmm. One person gets that idea, and then right away, um, that idea is then um, projected not only through um, through like the printing presses and, and YouTube and and you know the airwaves. It's like it's it's there on a psychic level, right. and then the more people that that are receptive to that through any of those channels of communication. Um, the, the, it's like a positive feedback loop. The stronger the the stronger the the signal becomes, and then, um, the, like the the worst case or the best case scenario being that you you get this idea that is present and believed strongly by by large groups of people for hundreds or, th or thousands of years, and then that that just gives it this inertia, like this power that's just like just like a steamrolling through history until it's, everybody knows that right until everybody knows that so that's why i mean so you talk to well the, the isn't of going back for a minute the uh the whole idea of being born into a quasi soul of evil i think that's what the gnostics were getting back when they talked about this being the world of the demiurge mm -hmm. that idea yeah well it was the yeah. gnostics it, i mean it goes back to just paul too yeah you know paul was writing about the uh, you know in the in the new testament the the ideas are there and that's like that's that's where uh, well, the Gnostics got their ideas from several, you know, yeah. several places, right. but um, like the the Christian Gnostics, at least, you know, they they had that as a as a basis too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this idea of of being born into like the whole world is inside the devil. Um, is, I can't remember which book in the Bible Power, that's from. Powers but. and principalities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so maybe just to okay, so you've got. Well, you've got, where are we now? We've got this, you know, this idea that's come into the world and we've got the mm -hmm. the people that start believing in it, the people that, let's say, join a movement, you know, join a, an ideology, they kind of, they become the true believers. And then that uh, that strengthens the signal, it strengthens the cycle. It's like you're receiving, you're receiving that, uh, that um, you know, the influence mm -hmm. of that quasi-soul and then you, are, you yourself then contribute to it, making it even stronger. Mm -hmm. And that creates essentially a template now. And that template... Um, reproduces itself. And so what we have is, n now the question becomes, tying it into our previous question, we've got this um, this kind of battle or like relationship between um, the like stability, the thing that is self-reproducing itself, you know, um, through time, it's mm -hmm. like, okay, same thing, same thing, same thing, Re repetition. But then you've got repetition, um, at odds with um, novelty, so the you've new got idea. yeah the new idea. So mm -hmm. you've got the you've got these competing forces: the forces of novelty and the forces of um, like repetition. Mm -hmm. And um, like, where do those come into play? That's that's basically like so on the most general level. That's where the where that's the question that Whitehead asked is like, well, how do we account for on the very basic, most general level, the idea of repetition and the idea of no of novelty? Mm -hmm. Because a world without novelty 
um, would just be the same thing over and over, right? We wouldn't get we, w we wouldn't get humans. We wouldn't get right. any form of life form. We wouldn't get any any form of new thing whatsoever. Whatever was there at the beginning would be what's there at the end. And that is not one of the aspects of of the creation or the universal universality that he he proposed is that the very essence of the universe is creativity. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to jump forward to this, but but one of the things that uh, uh, First Sight brought forward is the idea that prehension tends to come more often to the surface in a state of anxiety. Mm -hmm. Like, prehension is a scanning, right. scanning faculty. So... You, but what do you scan for? If you're a smart human, you scan for danger. You right. scan just, for. You, go ahead. Just a, a quick, uh, quick nitpick on that. Oh. It's not that this it comes in a state of anxiety. It's that anxiety promoting, yes. producing things tend to be the things that are received. Because yeah. once you're in a state of anxiety, then yeah. you're closed off to any kind of like okay. psychic yeah. influence or whatever. But the idea is that that if you're in a state of anxiety, it's easier to promote a solution. The, the the chosen solution. I mean, then then I mean uh, to to try and put that back towards, say the uh, the autistic confused girl mm. okay, yeah, yeah. is in a state of anxiety, and it makes it easier for this this crazy idea to take root. Right, because there's because there's a a motivation now to to bring back stability, right? Mm -hmm. To 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 reintegrate things. It's yeah. like because That's, the yeah the anxiety is the bad thing, mm -hmm. and you know when the when the bad the bad state is is taking over. It's like, okay, get back mm -hmm. to normal. Let's get back to normal and, and find the solution. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that is that, um, is that it it's not guaranteed that the that the the thing that you use to get back to stability will be ideal. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you might pick a bad substitute for you know yeah. for health or whatever. So this gets back to that you know um, that repetition and novelty thing. Is that right. um, the first recourse that you have is to the easy known solution, which may only be a, um, it may only be like partially helpful. Mm -hmm. It's like it's worked in the past to a certain degree, mm -hmm. but because it, but and because it has worked in the past to a certain degree, um, you know, it's available. But the 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 real solution might be a total novelty, so it, it will be less likely to be um, to be sought or to be found. Mm -hmm because it doesn't have a proven track record essentially right. so it's like so we that's why we can get stuck in um in these habitual forms of behavior that are that are um you know seemingly or well that do help to some degree mm -hmm. but that actually create other problems too so this is like the all of the all of the um like clinical data and research on like um you know the like responses to to childhood trauma trauma and stuff like that like things that that the the child's mind might engage in in order to protect um, to to protect the you know the child, mm -hmm. um, well coping strategies or whatever mm -hmm. and you know to extreme cases like extreme dissociation even to the point of dissociative identity disorder like these things will happen in, in, as a protective mechanism, right. but then um, you know as you get older those things uh, are are no longer um, ideal. You know, they're they're no longer the best option. It's like, in fact, they they then create problems. Right. So it's the thing that was brought about in order to solve a problem early on that then becomes a problem later on because it has been repeated and it's being repeated now in an, in an adult situation where it's no longer applicable. Mm -hmm. You know, as it was when you were a child. Mm -hmm. So you have this again. You've got this repetition of patterns, and in the case of these social contagions, it's like it's not a it's not a it's not a proven pattern in your past life, like you know, in the in the life that you've lived up until that point. But it's available in the wider kind of, right. you know, social influence. So it's like so you gra you can grasp onto that thing that's out there and be like, oh, um, on, well, and and it's not like you're doing this consciously. This is all happening, you know, on an unconscious level. You're not aware of it. Right. It's like on some level, um, it weighted and measured to be more a more positive choice, right? Then, because perhaps the pattern you've been following has not been working for you, right? So, but um, we got lost there. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I just want to come back to this, mm -hmm. this, um, you know, this repetition and novelty for a second, because because this was like the, um, like Whitehead 
one of the things Whitehead wanted to do was to give like the most general description of the like the principles at work in the cosmos as possible, mm -hmm. um, and then to, to explain like all the particulars from um, from the most complex particulars to the most simple ones. So you know, on the very basic level, you've got repetitions. Um, like very solid repetitions in the physical world, you know, on the level of of atoms and and subatomic particles, like you've got you've got um, um, like protons and neutrons that that can be very stable, you know, that can live. I don't know what the like. I was looking on Wikipedia and they've got like the the um, the lifetimes of certain atoms and particles mm -hmm. because you know some particles like the ones that you, you know that they see in like the Large Hadron Collider or whatever, you know, that they they live for you know, a split second, you know, mm -hmm. a couple microseconds or something like that. Mm -hmm. But, um, but pro I think it was like protons can live like, or they d do live like billions and hundreds of billions of years or something. So that they're basically just, you know, from, from, from event to event, they're repeating their past pattern. Mm -hmm. And that that's one of the reasons that, you know, Whitehead argued that we, that this, the, the matter that we see is so stable. It's because we're seeing a repeating pattern, like, um, a self reproduction of of that form of of being mm -hmm. and so um you know, and then you see that to a, to a degree in ourselves as well like we repeat past patterns we were that like that's why we're recognizable to the people that that we that we interact with mm -hmm. not just on a physical level but on like the the level of our of our character of our personality it's like there are repetitions there are things that stay the same we repeat we repeat ourselves from moment to moment but like um so but within that that repetition, there has to be the introduction of novelty. Otherwise, the world would not be explainable. It w well, it wouldn't ex exist as we find it. Like mm -hmm. we need to introduce the some some idea of novelty in order to be able to account for th like the reason, or to, in order to account for why the world is the way it is. There there is novelty um, in the world. Um, it's it's a, like a self evident fact that there's novelty. Mm -hmm. So where does the novelty come from? That's the question we were you know asking okay. at the beginning, and on some level. Um, it seems to just be that that's the way that that the the world is structured. The world is structured to bring in novelty to some degree, and um, like who knows what the ultimate answer to that is. But it it seems that um, well, the best the the best explanation I've you know come across has been the one that um, um, that Jordan Peterson has given. Like just his description of consciousness seems to be seems to me to be. Um, not only true, but like true on levels that are even deeper than than um, um, than Peterson talks about, because he's mm -hmm. just talking about the nature of like of human consciousness. But I think it applies everywhere. Like Whitehead would say that it's a general principle of the cosmos mm -hmm. that um, that what consciousness does is consciousness is that which encounters potential and brings and and, and collapses that down into one actuality. So you 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 confront in like this this field and or sea of infinite potential mm -hmm. and and that can be like the the world of meaning that carpenter talks about and uh, then on some unconscious level that world all those meanings are weighted um you know positive or negative and then um and then you know th there's like this collapse that happens it's like okay that option is the one that gets chosen mm -hmm. on on some level and gets brought into reality right and so new ideas are out there you know they they exist they exist in some sense mm -hmm. you know as a as these potentials you know they're they're out there for the grabbing and what what it is that that actually brings it in would be like you said about marx it's like there's it's the it's a combination of the of the um like the 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 repetitive um like the repetitive parts of oneself, the, the 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 character that you've established for yourself, your own emotional, you know, mental makeup with all of the social influences, all of every influence that's been acting on you, that's that's like your context. That's the that's the your starting point. And then from that starting point, it's like, okay, here are some options available. And um, so for Marx, it was like, here is Marx with his particular, you know, emotional makeup, his a particular character, his particular like psychopathology, you might say, <laughs> yes. and uh, and so what are the options available for that? Given all of the things that he's interested in, given all the things that he knows, well, he's going he's going to to be receptive to a certain type of theory that is you know a potential theory. Mm -hmm. Potentially, there were all kinds of other theories that he could have come up with, right. but of course, he came up with the one with the one that he did, yep. and that's essentially it's like um, um, it's it, so it was this like combination of like the existing 
like the the the, the, the world that, as it has as it existed at that moment and as it had existed previously that created that moment you know in in confrontation with the the potential futures mm -hmm. that were you know um, linked in some meaningful way with that present so th there's marx with his available options some options would be not available for him like marx wouldn't have been able to come up with um the beatitudes right <laughs> right yeah, so, <laughs> they just wouldn't exist for him right not a not a live option for <laughs> for marx so so that that's where that's why we get the, the thing that we get and so when, when we look at the um the examples like um like the telephone right or um like you'd you'd brought up an example to me um you know, when we were talking this week about oh, songs, yeah, songs, music. Talk about that one. Um, yeah, this is a, this is something I noticed early, early on. Like I was in my teens, I didn't know much about anything, but I would had noticed, being a good little radio listener, that songs, and even art and movies all ran in themes. Um, the one particular I noticed was somewhere in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, there was a whole string of songs about sailing and boats. And then there was a whole string of songs with stars, your shining star, be a star, whatever. But, you know, and you, you could chalk that up to artists steal from each other all the time, but it just seemed really odd that those would all come in a group. Mm -hmm. Or then you would have, like, the Rambo movies, and then science fiction and it would be you know and and you know obviously money chase is a good idea so you can account for it that way but just the fact that so many disparate artists would pitch on the same idea at the same time mm -hmm. and you kind of just, just made me sit up and go wow that's really weird yeah you know so uh so where were we going with that okay, that was well, the oh yeah so uh no i forgot <laughs> Well, I was thinking it's really interesting, you know, the, the way you framed Marx and, and the ideas that are available to him because, and, and then tying that to, to Peterson, because then that makes every person should be, every person important and everybody should be trying to be aware of what they are extracting from the information field, mm -hmm. how much we extract unconsciously and project outward, yeah. where you could be if you were aware, consciously waiting and evaluating the ideas that you extract. You know, I mean, some people do it naturally. You hear about some little kid who, you know, raises a bunch of money for, a, you know, an old folks home or whatever. They've mm -hmm. extracted that unconsciously, and that's a good thing. Um, you could chalk that up to the parents. But, but the idea that how much we are taking in and applying without ever putting a conscious eye on it at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the that's probably the the big um the big Im implication of looking at the world like this. Mm -hmm. Like uh, you know, like in that quote, one of those quotes that I read from Griffin's book, it's like we're not only constantly um like within this sea of influences, but we are actively contributing to it. Mm -hmm. So, for get, for good or ill as he puts it. Mm -hmm. So, th that's th so we actually have a responsibility um, it's not just, you know, it's, it's not like we're just living in this, um, um, you know, convenience store or like amusement park where it's like everything's there for our convenience, for our amusement. It's like, no, what you, act, what you do actually matters. It's like you're contributing to, to, to everything else constantly. Right. And, and you're influencing everything else constantly. And so are you, are you a bad influence essentially, you know, um, <laughs> You know, are are you? Because you can't not be an influence, right? You can't not be an influence. So, are you going to be a good one or a bad one? Or are you going to be like, uh, you know, one of those friends that your parents don't, <laughs> or that your friends' parents don't want them to be around? It's like <laughs> there's, like the the universal parents are are watching and <laughs> and and judging, <laughs> you know, um, in, in a symbolic way. <laughs> um, but uh, so, but the, the, well, where I was going with that. Uh, with the you know with your examples of like the the songs and the the inventions and and things like that is that um oh I actually I forgot again where I was going to go with that so it'll, just, it'll show up <laughs> it's out there yeah <laughs> so basically um yeah so there seems to be um in the in the creation of 
of not only personal beliefs, but mass beliefs, which are just personal beliefs, you know, that are just, um, you know, spread out and, um, um, you know, amplified. There is this, this question of the source and mm-hmm. then um, the, the source and then the reproduction, um, the reproduction in other minds, you know, in, in a social group, mm-hmm. and then the reproduction of that totality, you know, this, the, the quasi soul or whatever, uh, the spirit of the age. And that can be, <clears throat> or that probably does become a, like, like Peterson says, it's like, that's the, that would be the conservative, um, like tradition mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. Like that's the, it bec- something like that will become a tradition. And all traditions, like all hierarchies, have their like tyrannical aspects to them. Mm-hmm. So there is a tyrannical aspect, tyrannical aspect to any form of tradition um, because it doesn't want the novelty. Mm-hmm. And, but the, but then, but there's a, um, that's why we have to like square the, square the, the dichotomy or the, 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 mm-hmm. A versus B. It's like mm-hmm. there's tradition, with, and you can have good, good tr- tradition can be good or bad, right. you know, depending on the circumstances. And then you've got novelty, new things. Well, novelty can be, can be good or bad because novel, novelty can destroy an entire tradition and can just destroy everyone that, that was part of that tradition. Yeah. And not replace it with anything better. Right. So there's this, there has to be this like balanced mix between the the stability and the the re, the self reproduction of that system and the introduction of novelty to 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 avoid the disaster that 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 you know unchanging tradition might um, um, might like forebode and and to yeah to it's the it's the evolutionary not the revolutionary approach right it's like th- that things things need to evolve things do need to change to new cir- circumstances to adapt mm-hmm. um and and they do that through the, you know the hopefully the intelligence of the of the people involved of the, of the of the beings involved and um a rev- like revolutions tend to be you know um extreme novelty um and reactionary they're not a considered uh, a revolution to me by definition is not a considered choice of action it's an emotional reaction to mm-hmm. a tradition yeah. that has not been adapting mhm yeah so, so everyone's to blame, I guess. <laughs> and, um, yeah. Well, just, just, you know, going back to the personal level, then, then the idea of cultivating sort of a, a proactive approach, you know, to new ideas, not, not to pitch them just because they're new, but also not to adopt them wholeheartedly because they're mm-hmm. new and you're bored and, or you're so desperate you know, and, and, you know, desperation is a strong emotion, and that, that's where you would glom onto a new idea mm-hmm. without much consideration. Yeah. And that, that takes a certain amount of mental discipline. Yeah, and I think that that's, but, I, but it's possible, and I think a lot of people don't realize it's possible. Yeah. You know, a lot of people that are kind of like trapped in their traditions and, you know, of course see the value in their traditions, but don't see the danger of being limited to their traditions. Mm-hmm. Um that don't see that, uh, you know, because people make excuses for things, you know, in the name of, of traditions and in, in the name of stability and like inexcusable excuses. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's hard to change. You yeah. know, it's uh, the inertia, the inertia of a tradition is a lot easier than bucking it. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Even if, even if you're convinced that bucking it is a good idea, you know, I don't know. Maybe maybe that's why the young are usually the revolutionaries. They've got the energy. They've mm-hmm. got the energy to bucket. They've got you know a, a big middle finger to their parents and everything else. You know because you don't find too many middle aged revolutionaries. You know the Corbins and the and the the Howard Zins mm-hmm. are kind of a rare breed, and their followers are usually like their grandkids. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I guess there's something about um, you know being young that must. Like it must, the, like the shape you're of your mind, open. yeah. You're still, you're still, you're still more open than you were. You have, you haven't like calcified into the, you know, the, the old, um, fart. Yeah, the old fart. Well, but, but. you you haven't been fully indoctrinated into your traditions yet. Maybe you haven't received the benefits mm-hmm. of your tradition yet. Yeah. Um, some traditions require, so you know, a really long period of you know vetting, so to speak. Can you get a job? Can you hold the job? Can you conform to it? Um, and when you're denied, you know, 
this is the big millennial beef. They're in their 30s and they're still working gig to gig. Mm -hmm. That would give you a rather revolutionary mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, <laughs> with that said, <laughs> was there any, were there any like, uh, any other points you wanted to make? Any? No, no, that was ones? pretty good. I, 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 um, the idea of expanding it out to uh, account for the need of the universe to, to continue to move and grow, mm -hmm. and yet it can be brought right back down to the individual's need to move and grow, but mm -hmm. in a conscious, hopefully positive fashion. I mean, it works all the way up and down the scale. It's yeah. great. Yeah. All right. Well, that was well put. So uh, I think we'll call it a night or call it a day or whatever it is where you're watching right now. So thanks, everyone. Take okay. care. Thanks. Thank you.